like back here to triage the case and determine whether or not to connect over video. Make sure that the patient is transferred for a non-contrast head CT. Again, if they're in that extended window, they might recommend CT, CTA to be done simultaneously. Connect over video as indicated. Um, they can be reviewing the main uh, medical record as well as history. Um, if you have EMS or family and the patient's in CT, go ahead and get them on video so that way the neurologist can be interviewing them and getting that history, really any resource or anyone they can pull from, just like if they were to be in the actual ED, they would want to. Can they um, access our all scripts? Yep, so they, we are working on access for them um, to be able to view the record, the patient's history, all that good stuff. Labs, they can view imaging. Uh, we do have a direct VPN for our images to go to our outliner packs, and then they'll also be pushed to your pack, so when they have access to the EMR, they can be viewing it in either one, just in case there's technical issues or if they have a preference. Um, so like I said, even before that patient arrives, they can be viewing that patient's history in the EMR as long as they have that patient information. Um, complete some neurological exam with the assist of the ED, hospitalist or nursing staff. Uh, receives a call from the reading radiologist regarding imaging results and we really stress for them to review that image uh, remotely in addition to the radiologist and the ED staff as they are the ones that are going to be ordering that IV all the place. Um, having that consent discussion with the ED and then um, they will be the ones that will be having that final, give the final go ahead to treat with IV all to place. They can actually put the orders in? They can't place the orders in, but they will be giving the final go ahead oh, for the criteria. So, And then the ED physician will be entering the actual orders for IV all to place. So. Um, let's see. Sorry, I lost my voice here. Um, and then if the patient does require intervention, um, the ER is going to be aware of Dr. Randy's schedule. So just let the neurologist know whether or not he's available for intervention or not, and then they can decide whether that patient is going to be sent to IR here or if that patient needs to transfer to Stanford or elsewhere for a thrombectomy. Um, and they'll be having that discussion for neural intervention as well. And I if really the, don't know how to get a hold of Dr. Randy. Is he still by cell or? Yes. So in the protocol, we actually have his phone numbers. Oh, okay. So maybe we can post that in the ED for you. So that way, I've provided the numbers for our neurologists as well, but if they don't have the, all of the list or if they're not by your computer to be able to look at his numbers, It'd be helpful if you guys can provide that information to the neurologist just so that way it can kind of expedite that process. So his schedule should be available down there and then we'll also make sure that his numbers, because we have a set of numbers when he's in-house and then after hours for his cell and home so that the neurologist can call. Um, the primary, primary nurse, um, again it, this is if the code originates anywhere else other than the ED or the ICU, um, primary care of the patient will be transferred to the COVID coverage nurse. Um, however, we are relying on you to be doing that assessment uh, for that patient and activating the stroke code process or delegating that to the unit clerk or house supervisor um, for that overhead page. Assist with the transfer of the patient to CT and to the ED and provide that patient report and hand off to the code coverage nurse who will then have that um, primary responsibility for the remainder of the stroke code. Um, so the code coverage nurse, they are going to respond to the overhead stroke code activation and assist with transferring that patient to CT scan. Um, they'll be applying the cardiac monitoring, checking vitals, SpO2, neuro checks, as well as uh, finger stick glucose, um, obtain IV access, again, we like to see two IVs placed, however, um, at a minimum, one large bore antecubital for CT and GEO prior to alteplase administration, but we don't want to see a delay in getting that patient to CT for that second IV. Um, obtain or estimate patient weight for alteplase <coughs> dosing and document in the EMR and relay that information to pharmacy. Um, notify the ED physician or hospitalist if systolic blood pressure is greater than 185 
or if diastolic is greater than 110 um, prior to treatment. And we always recommend that you're checking that blood pressure immediately prior to administering that bolus just to make sure that it's within those parameters, especially if they have been hypertensive. Um, the neurologists are pretty aggressive. They'll usually give one or two doses of levetalol, and then they switch to nicardipine pretty quickly just to get that aggressive blood pressure control. Um, again, insertion of Foley catheter is not needed. It is something that we do not require for IV alteplase um, administration, and we don't want that to delay um, and administering of drug. Um, so for IV alteplase, um, if after hours obtain that mixing kit in the ED acidose, verify the order to administer, verify the, the dosage. Um, it is a weight-based medication, so 0.9 milligrams per kilogram, and does have a max dose despite the patient weight of 90 milligrams. Um, obtain blood pressure, like I said, immediately prior to that bolus, making sure systolic is less than 185, diastolic is less than 110. Perform that dual nurse sign-off. Again, we, even though we're really trying to treat emergently, we, it is still a high-risk medication, so we do um, really stress for all of our sites to be performing that dual nurse sign-off. Um, the first part of the dose is, uh, first 10% is given over um, IV push bolus over a minute, and the remaining 90% is infused over 60 minutes. And then as soon as the IV alteplase is done in that same tubing, flush with at least 50 mils of normal saline, and this will infuse us the same rate as the IV alteplase infusion. And really the purpose of that is to make sure that that patient gets every single last drop of that IV alteplase. Not only important for treatment, but it is also a very expensive drug, so we want to make sure that they get that complete dose. Um, if IV alteplase is still infusing um, and that patient is for some reason transferring to an outside facility, just give that flush bag to EMS. Oh, sorry, that's me. <laughs> I think the battery is probably dying. Okay, I'll talk really loud. <laughs> can y'all hear, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so again, we really encourage and stress IV alteplase to be given as a three-step process. So bolus, infusion, and flush. So even if you're transferring that patient out to an outside facility, um, give EMS that flush bag so that way they remember to give that flush as well. Um, code coverage nurse continues, so they're going to be performing vital signs and neuro checks, or they abbreviated NIH, every 15 minutes times 2 hours, every 30 minutes times 6, and then hourly for 16 hours for a total of 24 hours. Um, so, and that is really because within that 24 hour time frame, um, those patients are at risk for hemorrhage. So something that we closely monitor. And then after that 24 hour period, we do repeat imaging just to rule out any hemorrhage for those patients. After you've administered Alteplase, the blood pressure requirements do drop. So make sure that you're maintaining systolic blood pressure less than 180 and diastolic less than 105 after you treat that patient. So prior to treatment, 185 over 110 after you treat, and during that 24 hour period, 180 over 105. Uh, monitor vital signs, or uh, monitor for signs and symptoms of CNS hemorrhage. So um, sudden onset of headache, change in level of consciousness, nausea, vomiting, um, or change in focal deficits can be signs of hemorrhage. Um, so we'll go into that a little bit later in a few slides. And then also angioedema. So this is kind of a rare complication but has been seen um, where patients have swelling of the lung tips and lips and oropharynx and these patients can be at risk for losing their airway and may need to be intubated. Um, so again after the initiation of IV alteplase uh, transfer that patient back to CTA or CT scan for a CTA to assess for a large vessel occlusion. If a large vessel occlusion is identified transfer the patient to that um, IR suite for neural intervention. If Dr. Arandi is not available, those patients will transfer to Seaford. Um, always keep stroke patients NPO. We don't 
require that you do a dysphagia screen during the stroke code process, so just keep them in PO until they're stabilized, um, and then continue to monitor that patient. What is the um, low blood pressure, like, you know, you don't want it too low, what's that cutoff? You're not wanting to get it below a certain... Um, so, usually, less than 100 is kind of what we, oh, okay. we monitor have, for. Okay. And we don't necessarily treat for hyperglycemia. So it's more so that hypoglycemia, if it were to be a mimic, so to treat that blood sugar. No, I meant blood pressure. Did oh, I blood, blood pressure. Sugar? Yes. Yeah. Either that or I haven't had enough coffee. Yet. Okay. Blood <laughs> pressure. Yeah. Um, you know, really kind of looking to see if there are neural changes or if it's kind of a sudden drop, because um, we don't want them to drop too really. We don't want them to drop too low too suddenly because right. then they're going to hypo perfuse. Right. Right. So. I would say there isn't really a standard. I thought you kind of wanted them a little bit. We hyper want them at least like 140s, okay. 150s. If they start kind of trending less than that, and yeah. even that might be borderline depending on the neurologist and what they're wanting for that patient too. We always kind of recommend, even if they transfer to an outside facility, that you maintain that head of bed to be flat, so that way they don't drop those blood pressures and hypo perfuse. So. We do like to see them a little, like you said, more on that hypo or hypertensive right. side. So, um, if you're even if you're getting to like the 120s, that's yeah. something that we yeah. might want to start some fluids or right. be kind of lessening that nicotine drip for. Yeah. So, how about diastolic? Um, diastolic. We, I would say. You don't want to go less than uh, yeah. that. Might be it's a standing nice. question, but usually like eighties to nineties. Um, we can talk to Sandy a little bit more about what she kind of recommends, but just as long as it's not, we don't want to see like a sudden kind of drop. If you're seeing that pressure go from you know one eighties to like one thirties, mm -hmm. then we know to find a physician. <coughs> if you're trending like one fifties, one sixties. And <coughs> haven't seen a neural change or anything like that. That's okay, um, but it's kind of when they start trending below, like the 140s, 150s, that we kind of start to get a little worried. Mm -hmm. So with staffing in that first two hours, do you mm -hmm. have it a one-to-one -one nurse? Or? So for IV alt-place patients, we always recommend that they're one-to-one. -one. So they will be going to the even if they haven't been treated with mm -hmm. intervention, they'll be going to the ICU for. So who are we changing our staffing patterns? In? The departments then? Or? Yeah, she she talked about calling an extra staff. Yeah. Yeah. That was sort of right there. Yep. The TPA mixing in after hours, is there a way that we could designate that to the home supervisor instead of the teachers? <coughs> so the role is we don't, ED and ICU both do code coverage. So mm -hmm. if the ED nurse is code coverage, we don't have another. Person oh. unless they okay. call somebody. Yeah. And at that point it would be nice if the house supervisor was that designated person yeah. for mixing with the TPA. We could definitely look at that. We're just kind of feeling I don't know, I personally feel like that's kind of a lot of responsibility and if there's one nurse that's doing everything. Mm -hmm. Plus they have other patients. Mm -hmm. Right. Plus we have to give our other patients mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can I can bring that back to Abby and we can take a look at that. I'm just Water from the IQ. Uh, but but yeah. if you're by a bedside. But if I'm by a bedside, yeah, you're one to one. It depends on what's going on in the department, too, uh, as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. You can have one or two other nurses working with you. And if it's the yeah. supervisor, I'm sure would mm -hmm. step up and help with that. Yeah. Or should. Yeah. But if you have one or two other mm -hmm. patients, mm -hmm. one of your cohorts could be mixing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anybody make TP units already? Is that what this is a concern? No. It is only <laughs> mixed only at the, yep. That and, and <laughs> Gen Genentech also has certain criteria. So if, if you mix it and you don't give it for refunding, so it has to be that you ruled out a hemorrhage and have that indication to treat that patient as part of that reimbursement process too. So there's a there's a lot that goes into 
um, all to play, so it can only be mixed if you have that intent to treat that patient and their meeting criteria. Yeah. Good question. Um, so the radiology tech, so they're going to prepare the CT scanner um, and push images to the Alina packs. Um, and they'll also notify the radiologist, so whether it's an in-house or a virtual radiology, of who the Alina telestroke neurologist, as well as the callback number. So that way the radiologist can connect with the Alina telestroke neurologist and they can review the image results. Um, so the radiologist, they are going to review the results and have that discussion with the Alina telestroke neurologist and um, roll out hemorrhage or review that CTA um, to assess for a large vessel occlusion. Um, pharmacists, when they're in-house, they will verify and mix and deliver Alteplase. Um, after hours, Cardinal Health will assist with um, Alteplase verification and the ED nurse will mix Alteplase after hours. And like I said, I'll, I'll bring that back about including the house. We have an interactive, so we don't even call Cardinal Health. Yeah, we don't do it in oh, okay. after hours. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do, do they do anything with verifying or signing a Okay. Yeah. Um, lab tech, so they're going to respond and draw blood uh, for the patient for processing. And one thing with the previous standards, um, unless they're on Coumadin, we might wait for an INR to start IV Alteplase, and there are some of our neurologists that actually won't even wait for that because they can stop it once they get that INR back. Um, so we don't really even wait for labs unless for some reason we really suspect that they're going to be off to treat that patient. So um, we do always draw labs, but it's not a showstopper essentially for um, IV Alteplase. And even with the CTA, um, previously, we would do ISAT creatinins or quick check of creatinine on patients. And this is really something that we've kind of moved away from too, unless for some reason um, it's a discretion, at the discretion of the neurologist that they were to have a history of renal disease. We don't have an ISAT machine. No, and that's okay. Not all of our sites have ISATs, but even just a regular creatinine we used to wait for. Um, and we don't delay CTA unless for some reason we're really suspecting that they can't handle um, the contrast eye because we always go neurons over nephron. Um, neurointerventional radiologist, so this is going to be Dr. Rand um, Dr. Randy. Um, he'll receive a call from the Atlanta Telestroke Neurologist regarding a possible intervention patient. Um, if he's able, we'll review CT, CTA images. Um, and we'll activate the interventional team by phone call or text if there is a large vessel occlusion identified. We'll review the risk and benefits with the patient and or family and obtain consent for the procedure. Perform <laughs> neuro intervention pr pr procedure as indicated <coughs> and enter post-intervention orders for the ICU. So the interventional, and we are developing order sets for the post-thermectomy um, patients. So uh, we have kind of a breakdown for those patients that have been bridged or treated with IV alteplase and thermectomy or just thermectomy. Um, just because there's different things with the sheath that we recommend for those patients that have been anticoagulated. Um, Neurointerventional radiology team, they will receive the call or text and come in at, um, if it's after hours and prepare the IR suite for the patient or procedure. Uh, respiratory therapy, if they're in-house, they will respond and stabilize the airway as needed. Um, if after hours, they'll receive a call if indicated to come in for the stroke code. And we've developed a little bit of kind of a decision tree for the the transfer process. Um, so as Sandy indicated, those patients that have intracerebral hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, or subdural hematoma um, that require the special vascular um, neurosurgical or um, neurointerventional management um, would be transferred to United. Uh, really anything that would be uh, time sensitive, so a mechanical thrombectomy if Dr. Randy is not available, 
or if they're an intracerebral or subarach or subdural hematoma that requires that immediate um, intervention for concerns of intracranial pressure would transfer to Stanford. Um, but otherwise, some of those other cases, we may recommend that they transfer to <coughs> United for that um, neurovascular expertise. And that decision making is something that you're not going to have to do. That will be in cooperation with the ED physician as well as the neurologist with kind of determining what is the best for that patient. Mm -hmm. So IV alteplase, so monitoring. So again, once that patient has received treatment, we need to maintain um, systolic blood pressure less than 180 or diastolic less than 105 um, during the 24 hours after alteplase administration. Um, typically, we use IV labellol or nicardipine drip um, per physician order. Um, again, vital signs and neural checks are abbreviated. NIH um, is something that you do. Some of our sites just do neural checks, but there is a tab for abbreviated NIH for you to document this. Um, so we really stress blood pressure and the NIH should be done every 15 minutes times two hours, every 30 minutes times six, and then hourly times 16 hours then per unit protocol. Um, something that we often see missed is the blood pressures are documented, but not always the abbreviated NIH or neural checks. So, um, and a lot of times that's, they're done, they're just not documented, so making sure that you're doing both pieces of that. Um, continuous pulse ox, keep um, that oxygen saturation greater than 94%. And if you're having issues with um, maintaining that blood pressure per the parameters, um, notify the physician, or if there's any signs of deterioration, such as sudden uh, severe headache, nausea, or vomiting, or change in neural status. Um, also call a physician if there's heart rate greater than 120 or less than 150. If they have an elevated temp or respiratory rate greater than 30 breaths per minute. Um, some other considerations, <coughs> do not administer antithrombotics or anticoagulants for the first 24 hours. And do not administer prior to that patient having a follow-up CT or MRI to rule out any hemorrhage. Um, avoid any venous or arterial punctures for at least three hours and additional line placements such as NG tube or catheter for at least two hours after administering alteplase. Um, apply direct pressure or pressure dressing to any compressible puncture sites. Um, notice, notify the physician if you have any suspicion of intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, uh, and so if that were to happen, oh, yep. So you got the three hour window there for no arterial so, for thrombectomy, that does sound very good. So, a lot of, so, with that situation, um, yes, yeah. yes, yes, and really we don't see, yes, you know, that she stays in post TPA, their blood pressures trend lower, what would be a point for them to be kind of calling or getting too low if they're going to hyper hypoperfuse? Uh, yeah, we don't really set any criteria, so you know whatever you know we're comfortable with it at the time. I hate to put anything in standard orders simply because it's going to be different for every patient. You know, um, if you're one of those people that walks around with a solid of 90, 
insisting that your systolic be above one ten or something like that is is kind of hard on you. We don't really want to be using pressors in that situation. So I think that's kind of a case by case basis. And just kind of if they see maybe like a sun drop or any neuro changes. To <coughs> right, right, yeah. I mean, if it's dropping below 100 and, and um, you're worried about it, uh, we'll want to know about it and maybe we can set some criteria. In some cases, we might, you know, do a bowl of or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I just don't think it's something to codify in an order set because it's so variable. Yeah. Okay. So, post alteplase, if you suspect that the patient is having intracranial hemorrhage, um, if the IV alteplase drip is still infusing, stop the infusion, notify the physician, and they'll order a stat non-contrast head CT and transfer that patient to CT scan. Um, and then there is a post alteplase hemorrhage order set that we are working on implementing as well, and that will be for the physicians to do any reversal agents as needed if there is a hemorrhage on CT scan. But really the biggest takeaway for you is to stop that infusion, notify the physician, and transfer to CT. Um, so orolingual angioedema, um, this is something that we've added to the order sets as well for monitoring. It is a rare complication. Um, does happen more so with patients that are on ACE inhibitors such as uh, lisinopril or have insular cortex involvement stroke. Um, symptoms include swelling of the tips, lung, tips, tongue, lips, <laughs> and oropharynx <laughs> on the contralateral <laughs> side of the stroke. Um, interventions, again, if that IV alteplase um, is infusing, stop that infusion, notify the physician right away, and monitor for that airway as they may require um, intubation. Um, impaired treatments include antihistamines, corticosteroids, and epinephrine, and again, we have developed kind of a standard um, order process for this as well for the physicians to order drugs. I can tell you, you know, I've been practicing for a long time, and I've seen it about 10 times. I, I can only call once, but it required intubation. Mm -hmm. It's pretty rare. It, there's a changing uh, approach to this that's just sort of developing in the literature. So right now we kind of treat it like an allergy with you know the antihistamine kind of approach. And but there's growing concern that we're not really addressing what's really going on. We still do that because that's what's recommended. But um, watch the changes in this. In fact, we even put it into the order set that. It's kind of uh, odd, but, but um, giving FFP might give you compounds that, that will reverse the angioedema. And so there might be a quick solution if you have um, you know, a case that's really you know, blown out and we're headed towards intubation, giving it like, you know, something we ask you So although that's sort of new, we did put it in the order set as something that's you know, you know, kind of a policy, not really in order, but just consider it. You could, you know, but if you're if you're early on and it's going to swell some more, you want to get in there before you know, have anesthesia helping with it. It's going to be hard intubation before it's an impossible intubation. So, you know, very often it's, it's one or the other. It's oh, they aren't going to require anything else. They're to anesthesia. Okay. So we We'll go into a little bit about mechanical thrombectomy, and again, we've um, developed some order sets for these types of patients as well, so you'll get a little bit more familiar with, with the monitoring for these patients. So for those patients that have only received mechanical thrombectomy, they haven't been treated with IV alteplase, they were outside the window or didn't meet the treatment criteria, went to IR. Um, we recommend that you always monitor the puncture site as well as CMS and distal pulses. Um, so this is beginning post-procedure and post-sheath uh, removal. So monitor for any hematoma, um, change in peripheral pulses, temperature, color, and sensation to the extremity. Um, so every 15 minutes times four, every 30 minutes times two, every hour times two, and then every four hours times 24 hours. Um, these patients are going to be on strict bed rest for four hours um, with the catheterized extremity extended, um, may log roll or be in reverse Trendelenburg, may use the tuck sheet um, to keep extremity extended as needed, 
and can elevate the head of bed 15 to 30 degrees for comfort one hour after the puncture site has maintained hemostasis. So um, after you've done that initial assessment. So uh, really try to keep an eye. We, um, we'll kind of go over some of the complications more, but we just want to make sure that we don't have an ischemic leg or any bleeding into that puncture site. So for, oh. Yes. Even without the alpha place, you do one-on-one? -on -one? Or post-armectomy. Post you know, I can touch base with Lynn and Abby a little bit more on the staffing or just the thrombectomy. Because, see, Andy, what do we do? We do just one on ones for. Yeah, we have been usually in, in, in yeah. our ICU in, in part because, you know, anybody post rescue treatment, uh, we're going to want to address any sense of hemorrhagic complications right away. And so we've, we've addressed it the same way with every 15 minute, but it's been in a good at our site as well. We really need every 15 minute, and if we need every 15 minute in the beginning, then we do one one. But, um, you know, I, I think you could argue that the risk of hemorrhagic complications is maybe a bit lower, and as long as you're okay and still doing this frequency of neuro checks with some, you know, patients, and you're not one to one with them, then, then you know, I think that's fine. But, but you know, there's going to be lower risk, but all the places. Staffing in at night, yeah, like sometimes we only have one ICU nurse with patients. We have before. two ER nurses and a host of others. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it gets a little bit tight. Here, we need some. Do the carry. We've already done the call. I don't want to put myself in a position to compromise. Yes. I'll just put you in a position. Okay, and then for those patients that have received thrombectomy as well as IV alteplase, so we do have the monitoring um, a little bit different as we do keep the sheath in um, because they are anticoagulated. So um, post-procedure, pulse, CMS, and puncture site evaluation every 15 minutes times four, every 30 minutes times two, and then every hour while the sheath is in place. And then immediately after the sheath is removed, every 15 minutes times four, every 30 minutes times two, every hour times two, and then every four hours times 24 hours. Um, strict bed rest while the sheath is in place, and then the patient should remain, remain flat for an additional four hours after the sheath removal. Again, you may log roll or reverse from Dellenberg, um, use the sheet tuck to keep extremity extended, and can elevate the head of bed um, after that sheet has been removed. Um, so monitoring, again, groin site monitoring, um, minor bleeds, hold pressure for at least 10 minutes and notify the in intensivist or hospitalist if bleeding continues. Um, monitor the cat catheter site as well as distal pulses. Um, again, pulses, temperature, color, and sensation of the extremity. May apply an ice pack, um, PRN for pain management. Um, glycemic control, Control hyperglycemia can lead to increased mortality, worsened function, and increased volume of the infarct on CT scan. Um, so try to maintain it. You will, you will glycemia, um, and use sliding scale insulin and bedside blood glucose testing uh, QID for at least the first uh, two days um, if initial blood glucose is elevated and as well as maintaining temperature control as well as high fever um, is an indicator of poor prognosis. Um, avoid aspiration, keep these patients NPO until you're able to do a dysphagia screen or have speech consult. Um, SCDs for those uh, post alteplase patients because we can't use a Q-heparin or anything like that. Um, so NVT prophylaxis. Um, early mobilization for those patients that have not received um, Obviously, those that have received mechanical from back to me after they're on bed rest, um, doing that mobilization, um, nutrition, avoiding of infection, and early fully catheter removal if there is one in place. Um, some complications to monitor for are change in level of consciousness, increase in NIH, pupillary changes, um, sudden head headache, nausea, or vomiting. Um, these could be signs of reocclusion, hemorrhagic conversion, and edema or swelling of the brain. Uh, vascular site complications, um, so again, checking that pulse for equality and temperature of the limb, 
monitoring for hematoma or occlusion, uh, retroperitoneal hemorrhage, uh, monitor for back pain, bruising of the flank, abdominal distension, um, peri umbilical ecchymosis, hypotension, and tachycardia, uh, pseudoaneurysm, this could be pain at the cap at the groin site, swelling, um, pulsatile mass as well as systolic brewery, arterial venous fistula, uh, panastolic brewery, thrill, swollen and tender extremity, arterial thrombosis, so they'll have pain in that leg. Um, Peeler paresthesia, pulselessness, and monitor for infection, any signs of inflammation, um, sepsis, abscess, or erythema. And Sandy, I don't know if you want to take over to the NIH. So the case in the ER was a vertigo case. <laughs> and it, it was a good example, actually. So the lady came in and she had awoken with the, the vertigo. But she had had hearing changes the night before. Well, that doesn't go along with benign positional vertigo where an otolith is stuck in a canal that has nothing to do with your hearing. So she had kind of a benign positional vertigo presentation. She'd get dizzy and nystagmus when you move her. And then if you left her still, she was fine. So I wouldn't have called a code on that, but she had these hearing changes that accompanied it. So we had sort of something that pointed one direction and the other direction. So appropriately called a code on it. Uh, her examination wasn't very helpful, which isn't unusual, you know. And we didn't do the whole pike maneuver yet, but uh, we did the rest of the exam, didn't find anything else uh, focal on the exam, did a CT, and since she had woken with a deficit, even if it was a stroke, I don't think it probably is, but even if it was, she's not a TPA candidate, so we just went ahead and did the CTA right away. We looked at all the little vessels that come off the basilar artery, and they were all open. So we don't have a large vessel process to address. And so then we could relax and say, okay, well, we still don't know if it's a stroke, but we're done with the stroke hope. We don't have a rescue treatment option for her if it is. And then your hospital has something I haven't seen in any other hospital. You have a physical therapy coming down and doing the hull pike maneuver test to see if it's benign positional vertigo and then fixing them on the spot. And using, you know, friends of lenses and everything to do it, that's Fantastic. I can't tell you how impressed I was. So um, so I've got to file that away for my own partners because <laughs> they aren't going to be ready for how prepped you are. That was really great. So I didn't even have to do my own hall pike maneuver, which we sometimes will do over video. So I, I suppose it's possible we might be finding ourselves trying to do a clumsy hall pike maneuver over video at, at nighttime sometimes when the physical therapist isn't there, but which is you know, that's where you lay the patient down with their head turned to one side, so I have to have you position the camera so I can see what their eye movements do when you're in that position. So we can do it, it's just not ideal. The physical therapy thing is great. Yes, well, cantalith maneuver is fixing it. Paul Pike is diagnosing it. Yeah, so you're looking for a certain pattern of eye movement changes and dizziness with their head in certain positions with the hall pike maneuver where you're testing and asking, is this benign positional vertigo or is it not? And then if it's a positive hall pike maneuver, then you get out that, those kennel procedures. It's a, or a liberatory maneuver. You're trying to liberate that little piece of debris that's stuck in the canal. And your physical therapist do it for us. So that's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> well, then, okay, I gotta get, get going. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so NIH stroke scale. I don't have. How many of you guys have had some sort of training in the NIH stroke scale? Wow. Oh, great. So I, I'm going to briefly go through this with an eye toward helping you do it with me. Okay. Since a lot of you already know it already, you know it's a quantitative measure of stroke-related neurologic deficit. Eleven items for 42 points maximum. It can be performed quickly, and the, the ideal thing with this is that, that it, it um, is reproducible. It can be performed by any number of providers if they're trained in it, and it can be reproducible between people, which our you know, standard kind of nursing uh, neuro check and my neurological exam I learned in medical school and in my training, those aren't standardized tests, and they don't give us a common language to work with. 
this does and it's quantifiable so it, it really helps us to communicate with each other when there's changes so we that's why we've really been kind of pushing on encouraging taking even just an abbreviated part of the NIH stroke scale for your neuro check so that we're still talking about the same thing so think about that so level of consciousness items there's three of them and uh, you Basically, with the first one, you're just observing, and you give them a zero if they're alert, a one or two if they're going to be less than alert. So one is drowsy, and so I gauge the difference between one and two, obtunded is two, is between whether or not I can engage them in conversation and keep them with me. If I'm having to you know, keep alerting them throughout the process and, and they're a little incoherent, that's obtunded to me, so that's a two. If they're drowsy and you can continue to engage them in conversation, it's a one. Three coma is defined very specifically with the NIH stroke scale as opposed to what I would have, you know, called a coma in my neurological examination in the past. That is, it's defined by their motor function. So if they are unresponsive and you don't have any good motor function in any of the four limbs, it's a three, it's a coma in the NIH stroke scale. But if you have someone who is unresponsive, you know, eyes closed, you can't awaken them, but they're spontaneously moving their left side, they might be paralyzed on the right from their left middle cerebral artery stroke, that's obtunded, that's not comatose. As long as they've got some purposeful normal movement in one of their limbs. Okay, so level of consciousness questions, item number two of the level of consciousness piece. Ask the patient her age or his age and the current month. And if you do those two things in a standardized way, then your examination is going to be reproducible between mine and yours. So if they're unable to speak due to a physical barrier, you arbitrarily give them a one. If they're aphasic or stuporous or comatose and they can't answer, arbitrarily give them a two. Otherwise, you score according to how many uh, they, they answer correctly or incorrectly. So um, if they answer their age correct, but they're wrong on the month, then you give them a one. If they're wrong on both, you give them a two. Okay. Zero if they got both right. Level of consciousness commands, same kind of idea. Standardized commands, so try to use the same thing. Sometimes you have to adjust because uh, it's a function that they can't do. And you, remember, you're trying to test level of consciousness and understanding and that sort of thing. So ask the patient to open and close their eyes and then make a fist and open the hand. And so um, give them credit. If they're obviously trying to complete it, but for maybe some motor weakness or something, they're a little slow with it or something, because remember, we're not trying to test motor. We're trying to test an understanding and whether or not they can follow through with a command appropriately. If they're a severe aphasia, like our Wernicke's guy, and you said, you know, uh, close your eyes and open them and he started talking about uh, golfing in the trees you know well that you know that's that's going to be a one for him on, on that one and then if you ask him to um, make a fist and open it don't give him any visual cues and he's unable to do it then you know it's going to be a two all right if they're stuporous or comatose you're going to arbitrarily give them a two now as I go along, there's going to be things where I say, you arbitrarily give them this card, you arbitrarily. And how do you remember all that stuff? So I'm going to give you a little cue. <coughs> Language, you can use the plates for assessing for aphasia from the NIH stroke scale. I, I don't usually, again, because of, you know, this is the way I do my, my stroke code exam. And I do anything I can to speed things up. So I'm assessing their speech. Over video, I'm watching you starting an IV and I'm starting to talk with the patient because I can't get at their arms and legs yet. And I'm assessing their language right then, just taking their history. So I listen to the fluency of their speech. Are they understanding me and giving me appropriate responses to my questions, that sort of thing. If there is some aphasia there, I might have to drill down a little bit, try some naming and repetition and a few other little tricks. But I don't usually pull out the cards unless you can, but but that's the way I'll probably be doing it over video with you. So I won't ask you to do much with aphasia. You give them one if they have maybe some word finding difficulty, and you give them two if they have a deeper aphasia than that, and it's really hard to have a conversation with them. A lot of times there's a little comprehension developing into the two stage, or their expression is really severely affected. But otherwise, one 
uh, if it's mild. If you give a three if they're mute and can't, can't speak, can't follow any commands. We call that a global aphasia. And then you arbitrarily give them a three. I sometimes give Warnicke's a three as well because their comprehension is so severely affected. But, but most of the time we're talking three is, is a global aphasia where you know nothing's going in, nothing's coming out. So you give them a three if that's their baseline they can't talk to? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, very good question because, you know, same thing for, you know, they have an old stroke on the right side, you're going <coughs> to your score because, again, your exam has to be reproducible with the next person coming on. Um, if they're comatose, you're going to arbitrarily give them a three. Okay, dysarthria. A lot of times people will conflate aphasia and dysarthria. Dysarthria is slurred speech, aphasia is disturbed language. Our gentleman with the Wernicke's aphasia had no dysarthria. He was articulating strange words perfectly, but none of it was slurred. So you need to make sure sometimes dysarthria, especially brainstem stroke dysarthria, can be so severe it almost sounds like an aphasia and you have to listen real close. Yeah, all the right words are there, they're just very, very slurred. So that would be a two on this scale. One would be they're slurred but you can understand them. Zero would be no slurring of their speech. You can't give, the, give a score if the patient is intubated. If they're comatose or severely aphasic, you arbitrarily give them a worse score. So if you have someone who's aphasic but not like our patient where he, he had words, globally aphasic, nothing's coming out of their mouth, and you have no idea whether if it came out it would be articulated.